Hello. Now, as many of you will know by now, securing my house and especially the workshop has been the hot button topic here over the course of the last two or three weeks. And about two weeks ago, I uploaded a video in which I presented a couple of DIY security measures that I employed in order to fix some issues that this house has in that regard. And over the course of the last couple of days, I actually put a ton of work into improving those original methods and I want to make a video about that, but the work on that has not yet been completed. So we will have to talk about something else today and it is different but related and it will be a look inside one of the IP cameras that I made a video about last weekend. And if you want to know more about what IP cameras actually are and what they can be used for, then you have to watch the last episode. In this one I will simply take a look at the parts inside. The particular model that we will take a look inside was marketed under the name Premium Blue PIPC011, but as I already established in the last episode, I think that it was manufactured by Apexis and is identical to the Apexis model APMJ011, which I think is marketed under many different names and probably in many different countries as well. But before we look inside, let's take a look at some of the outside features of the camera. We have of course the camera lens itself and under that a pretty useless status LED that's simply blinking. Under that a completely empty pinhole. And up here is a light dependent resistor for determining how bright the surroundings are. On the left and right we have a range of infrared LEDs for the night vision capability of the camera. And down here another pinhole, but this time for a microphone. Here on the back side on the left we have the audio output jack, then the network connector, a connector for the Wi-Fi antenna, and then an input output jack where external sensors and also external loads or devices can be attached. And this is just a power jack for plus 5 volts DC. So I remove the rubber feet and unscrew a couple of self-tapping screws and I can take off the plastic bottom part and uncover the motherboard of the IP camera. And now I can remove this little Wi-Fi module here from the board which by the way has a Mac ID printed onto it that is not identical to the Mac ID on the label on the bottom of the camera itself. And that is because you will use another device for Wi-Fi or for a cable connection. And if you want to use the Mac ID to find out the original manufacturer of the camera, you better do that when not using Wi-Fi. And I will put the main board aside for now and proceed with the teardown, but then take a closer look at the board later in the video. And now we can take out the motor that is used for the panning action of the camera, that is a rotation around its vertical axis. And that motor has, besides some Chinese characters, a current rating on it. It has five wires coming out of it and it also in general looks like a cheap so-called claw pole type stepper motor. And upon taking it out we can see that the shaft is not sitting in the center of the housing which tells me that there is also a reduction gear inside the enclosure of this motor. And just like with the PCB we will have a closer look at the motor later on. Okay, so now that we are inside the camera's head, we can find another identical claw pole type geared stepper motor, this time for the tilting action of the camera, that is its rotation around its horizontal axis. And here we have a little bi-directional switch that is activated when the camera is either pointed all the way up or down and is thus limiting the maximum tilting angle and it will also be used, I guess, in finding the homing position in the startup routine. And the same is also happening on the other axis. We have a switch like that in the bottom of the camera for the panning movement as well. And then of course we have another PCB that is holding the CMOS chip that is used for recording and probably also some conversion or adjustment of the video material. 
So the camera is now already completely disassembled and we will now take a closer look at some of the details and that CMOS chip will be the third thing after the PCB and the motor that we will take a closer look at. So let's take a look at the main board, shall we? Now this large part here is called S29GL032N90TFI04 and according to the datasheet it is a 32 megabit flash memory chip. And since this camera does not have a micro SD card slot, the memory on this chip, I guess, is all you got for pictures and video material. And the smaller part next to it is an AMS1117, and that is a linear voltage regulator that is at least marketed as an LDO. And this part on the left here is called AZ1117, and you can see the similarity to AMS1117, and that is because it is a very similar part, it's also a linear voltage regulator, in this case for a fixed output voltage of 3.3 volts. And this package here in the bottom right houses a ULN2803, and that is a Darlington transistor array. It means that it works like eight Darlington transistors inside one package and this is typically used and also in this case I guess as a driver stage for the stepper motors and it's pretty clear that those are two-phase unipolar stepper motors because if they were bipolar two-phase stepper motors you would require eight transistors per motor. This package here is a WITMAC HF81606 and that is a pulse transformer. This little white component here is a TLP181. It is an optocoupler that is, I guess, connected to the alarm pin of the input-output connector, the green one. And this would allow to attach an external motion detector or other sensors to the IP camera and also to isolate that signal electrically from the camera itself. And you can also see a small black electromechanical relay next to the green connector. And that is connected to the other two pins inside this connector. It actually has four. One is a ground pin. The other one is the signal input that leads to the optocoupler. And then you have two pins that are connected to the switch inside the relay. And via that, an external load, I'm thinking about maybe a siren or maybe lights, could be switched on and off by means of that relay. And let's take a quick look at the bottom side of this board as well, shall we? What we have here is a Nuvoton WN90N745CDG, and that is a microcontroller unit with an ARM7 TDMI CPU. And down here we have a Zentel A3V28S40GTP, and that is 128 megabits of SD RAM. And the chip over here is an IC Plus IP101A and that is simply the Ethernet transceiver of the IP camera. And this chip up here, and that might be a little more interesting, is a Nuvoton WAU1288 audio codec for IP telephones. And that pretty much explains how the two-way communication that I showed in my last video works. You better get off the property now. Okay, so I guess that 90% of the people who started to watch this video have gone by now, but for the 10% that remain, let's take a look inside one of those stepper motors then as well. And what you can see here is that, as I said, there is a reduction gear in here, really consisting of very tiny plastic gears, and we can just pull out the magnetic rotor of the stepper motor and inside you can see the actual claw poles or clauen pole as we say in German which gives these cheap rather old-fashioned stepper motors their name. So I certainly won't explain the basics of stepper motors in a video about IP cameras but you can see that you have two stator coils stacked on top of each other which makes this a two-phase motor. On these coils you have center tabs so that you have three leads coming from each of the coils which makes this a two-phase unipolar stepper motor. 
Then you have the claw pole construction, which makes this a two-phase unipolar claw pole stepper motor with a reduction gear included into the enclosure. But you have to say that it's a good thing that we have a stepper motor here at all, because I had, was under the impression that the 3CAM, the white one that I tested in the last video, uses actually normal DC motors and those are really much too loud for this application. Okay, so one last thing that I wanted to do before getting done with this is to check if the CMOS sensor actually has the resolution that the camera was advertised to have. And for this I have put the CMOS sensor under my old microscope here and please excuse the gorilla style footage here. I simply don't have any better equipment for doing something like this. And what I did is was to take a picture and count 10 pixels manually and then stack those units of 10 pixels next to each other so that I could see how much I can get here. And we see about 80% of the shorter side of the CMOS sensor on this picture. So I get to 39 units that equates to 390 pixels and if that is only 80% of what you can see, I guess that we get in close to 480p for real. So I guess the camera can actually do what it was advertised for in terms of video resolution. But still, the video quality of this particular camera is really, really bad. Okay, so much about IP cameras then. But as I told you, there will be more videos in the future that deal with the topic of home security. And there will also be other things. Over the course of the last week, I have received a whole range of really large packages that contain something that I might reveal in the coming days. And it came here, so much I can tell you, from Zurich, Switzerland, where one of my viewers works at a research laboratory for nuclear energy systems. And, well, that might sound a little crazy, but believe me, the things inside are really something. And uh, other than that, I want to reach out again, maybe a little more directly than in my other videos, and ask you guys to become Patreon supporters if you like this stuff and appreciate that I, like today, spent my Sunday working on a new video, then maybe, if you can afford it, head over to patreon.com slash tpai, a link is also in the video description, and consider to become a Patreon supporter of this channel. So, whatever you do, I hope you like this and to see you soon.